I need some traction. Hey, Traction fam. Super excited for today's episode. We sit down with Rob, founder of health tech company Row, which is worth over seven billion, and also the founder of snag.com. So Rob has an interesting journey going from healthcare consulting to becoming a successful entrepreneur in a number of fields, including his role in the phenomenal success of BarkBox, which you're going to dive into. So before we get into all of this stuff of company building, growth, et cetera, let's dive right into Rob's backstory. Let's dive right into Rob's backstory. I want to, I want to know how did you, you know, how did you get started in entrepreneurship? The back history of Rob, where did you grow up? Um, what made you the person you are today? Well, I don't know if we have enough time to uh, go into the full backstory, but uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Excited to be on the show and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, but yeah, so let's see. I was, I know we were talking before I was born in Virginia, uh, right outside DC, uh, go wizards, go commanders. <laughs> and, um, yeah, called my wife up to, um, New York, uh, back in the, the, the early aughts. Um, and I was working in healthcare technology consulting. We were helping hospitals go paperless. So there's like millions and billions of medical records that are historical that for EMRs or papers. So we helped them kind of scan that in and integrate with their existing medical record systems. Um, so it was um, interesting for a little while and then got pretty boring um, after an extended period of time where you, you're working with these hospitals that they're just well. Um, and it takes a long time to get them to adopt some new technology. Um, I was working with someone on like the sales side as well. These are like two or three year up sales yeah. cycle. And it can be very obviously exciting when you sign them, but also soul sucking to, uh, to be a part of. And so I kind of was always itching to find something complete opposite end of the spectrum. Like what are the things I could do where I could get immediate results and get immediate feedback. And as e-commerce started coming out, I saw, I remember saw um, a group on that. It was a right-hand rail group on, on Facebook. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like half price, you know, restaurant gift certificate. And I was poking around and I realized that's a business that I could probably build myself. That's not so complicated, right? Go walk around, get people to give you half price spa gift certificates and they sell them on your website. So that was really my initial foray into like e-commerce and the internet. Um, that was back in 2008, 2009, and it was awesome. It was just like quick, uh, way to, to jumpstart learning about marketing, learning about email lists, learning about like digital, uh, product. And so did that in conjunction with my job and uh, my full-time job. And then it got big enough where I, um, uh, wound up leaving and doing that full-time. Um, and daily deals were kind of hot, really hot for a period of time. Um, I kind of rode that wave and then didn't know what I was doing. Um, and went into selling the company to a competitor, I got really lucky in terms of timing and sold that in 2011. And now was when Groupon was going public and, um, you know, Living Social it was another company. They both had multi-billion dollar offers. So. Got very fortunate on timing and then used that as an opportunity to kind of pivot my career more around marketing um, and went deep into that and well, found myself at BarkBox, uh, Treats and Toys for Dogs back in um, 2012. Epic. Now, how did you get into healthcare consulting of all the spaces? I mean, it's super hard, right? My wife's a physician. My brother-in-law works in, like bo both her brothers are in the medical space, physicians. And it's super hard to sell into that space, like you pointed out. Like, you, yeah, three-year sales cycles. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen sales reps wait outside my wife's office, <laughs> trying to sell to her. So, how did you get get into that space? I mean, it was all really random. I went to Penn State, um, and I interviewed at a bunch of different places. I was majoring in basically business and technology uh, before they had a school for that. It was a combination of those two. Uh, fields and interviewed a bunch of different places across a bunch of different types of fields. Kind of wound up at this company that focused on healthcare. 
Um, and they hired a lot of young people out of school and we want to kind of trim them up, uh, trim them up. So it was, um, it was random. I would say I wasn't like thirsty for healthcare out of college, but I was thirsty for a job and, uh, they were able to provide that and want to be a really good foundational experience to learn about just working in a, working at a company, being a grown up, uh, being an adult uh, in this environment. And yeah, it is funny how kind of life can be full circle where that was the first job in 2005. Uh, and then, you know, fast forward to 2017 founding a healthcare company. That was, is not something I anticipated doing. Yeah. But a lot of like learnings, I feel like from consulting, like I started uh, in the consulting space as well, sales for a consulting startup that turned into a product startup. You learn a lot in terms of selling, in terms of building product from that mm -hmm. consultative process, right? That you can you can carry over to a tech startup because these days I find a lot of tech startups, all they do is start building without talking to the customer. Yeah. That's the first thing yeah. they do. Let's build software. And um, I come from a time like 2004 or five when I started working in the workforce, it was like, it was consulting and then talk to customers, figure out what they need, sell them to the need, then build yeah. build the stuff. So you learn yeah. uh, the process before uh, of how not to waste money because you need to you sort of kill what you eat kind of thing. Yeah. Now, I think I think in general too, any job that you have, there wind up being threads of even if you hate it, there wind up being really interesting threads of things that you can learn that then allow you to pick that up and kind of position yourself expert or be able to like get a job in a different field because you've spent a little bit of time marketing in this job or a little bit of time in finance in this job. Like, especially now, it, things are so mobile in terms of being able to move from one, you know, career path to another. You can kind of leverage that experience into whatever you want. Definitely. Now, how did you find BarkBox? I mean, at the time, it was pretty novel, right? Uh, Subscription-based e-commerce. Yeah, was was growing, and I think like maybe Groupon and Living Social were sort of were exploding, but then eventually the buzz started uh, yeah. to fade. So you sold yeah. a company to a Groupon competitor. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's tons of kind of competitors at the time, and I found one in New York called KGB. Uh, I wound up selling uh, the company to them, and kind of working through the earn out, and then. Yeah, I didn't jump to Bark right away. I kind of thought I was a super smart entrepreneur that like could build and sell companies. And so I wasted a fair amount of time and money trying to build other stuff out that, that didn't work. Uh, and then eventually I was like getting married and I was like, I need to get a job. Um, and so that was when I refocused, I would say, my experience and kind of massaged that into being more of a, like a marketing expert. Uh, the reality is like, you know, you're a small couple of person of business, you're doing a little bit of everything, but I was like, my path is going to be marketing. And so I wound up meeting the bar folks actually at a career fair. I went there looking to talk to them in one other company. Uh, my wife and I are big dog people, the whole family's dog, dog crazy. And so that was really cool. And it was novel at the time. There wasn't a ton of like e-com subscription. There was Burke box, which was kind of one of the first the beauty box. Uh, one of the first folks in the space. Bark was pretty soon after that. Um, so I got that opportunity to talk to them. They shared a very similar, weird sense of humor and outlook on life. Um, and really jived with the team and got the opportunity to join incredibly early. There was first marketing hire, um, employee number seven uh, at a very early stage. And, you know, got the opportunity to do and see and experience a lot, very, early and very quickly in, in the econ space. And then Bark became a massive success story. I think uh, had a multi hundred million dollar exit, right? Yeah, they're publicly traded now. They went, right. uh, they went public a couple of years back. Yeah, and, and uh, what were some of the key things you did there that contributed to early revenue? I was reading somewhere that Bark hit like 25 million in revenue in first year. Yeah, you know, again, it was interesting. It was very early um, in the space. And I remember being, you know, sitting at my desk on the day that like Facebook news feed ads long and having money to spend and having amazing creative, right? Like pictures and videos of dogs. There's not much better 
creatively. Yeah. So people are already looking at on the internet. Now you're just putting a CTA around it. Um, so I think early on, Facebook was a huge driver uh, of growth and uh, being early to the scene meant costs were still relatively uh, reasonable. And so uh, spent time there, spent time on influencers and Instagram and it's kind of just the early days of all this stuff. You don't realize it when you're in it, but there were all these dogs on Instagram that had like hundreds of thousands of followers. And so I kind of corralled them together and we got the team to create like the bark pack, we call it, where we'd send them a free bark box. And then, you know, one day each month, everyone would post their bark box pictures and videos with a hashtag. And there was, you know, we would kind of flood Instagram. And so that grew the account. We got a really huge organic Instagram following. And then building on that, we were able to launch out of home, we were able to launch, you know, TV, sponsorships, um, affiliate, kind of the whole performance playbook. Um, but it was really, really fortuitous uh, in terms of timing. Like there's a subset of companies that happen to be live and have dry powder to spend when newsfeed ads went live. And I think it would have been different launching today than it was you know, in 2011. Yeah, today, a lot of the things don't squeeze up as much ROI. I mean, like, ultimately, all these social platforms, what I find is in the early days, they hook you on, right? They make it very easy. The ROI is easy. And then over time, even with your own followers, they start reducing the eyeballs to your own followers, right? Like, it it costs you almost twice as much to generate the same ROI from the same spend. And then even if you have a huge organic following, I think, like, I, I was talking to Nas Daily, the founder and sire, and he said Facebook literally dropped his his viewership on his following for more than fifty percent, like like something like ninety percent. So initially, oh yeah, his, his users would see more than fifty percent, sixty percent of the content he put out, and he had like maybe in the millions of followers, and then Facebook eventually dropped that, so his Facebook revenue went to like. 10% of what he used to make. Or like, yeah, I mean, that was a whole ecosystem back in the day, right? It was like, you could build a huge organic following. You could monetize that. There's all sorts of content properties that did that. Bark had one, it was called Bark Post. Millions of followers, huge newsletter, et cetera. But, you know, Facebook kind of reached that point where they said, we're just gonna stop showing as much inventory because we need more ad space. And it killed a ton of businesses for folks that were you know, Nas Daily, a bunch of others that were reliant on that kind of free distribution, it really, really hurt. And so we were lucky in that while, while we took a similar hit, we had momentum on the commerce side. It wasn't just monetizing content. It was like content was additive, but not the core business. Folks that were content only really, really took a hit. And I think very few of those survived kind of the mass casualty of like the Facebook algorithm update. And that's what I I truly believe as well, right? Like all these social platforms, you're renting effectively their eyeballs, even if it's organic. And totally. they, they can drop the, the impressions on your own organic audience at a heartbeat by changing like the algorithm, like LinkedIn did yeah. very recently. Yeah. And so the, the best thing you need to do is create your own community online, first by collecting people's email address. Now, you guys were in an interesting space because, one, it's not an expensive product like a SaaS product, right? It, it's subscription-based. And to transact, people then need to provide their email address. So you could have built a massive community oh, like on newsletter and other platforms. So I want to I hear about that because a lot of people bash email. And it's always like every few months I hear this email is dying, email is dying. And I am of the belief, like, I mean, I've built various successful um, organizations on the sales side, GTM side, just leveraging the power of email. Like yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for it to die still. So I'm curious yeah. on your take on like uh, leveraging email and that automation side of things to continue to grow despite the dwindling um, effects of the, of these social platforms. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm I'm with you. I'm a I'm a huge proponent and believer in email. And part of that I think comes from like my background with daily deals. It was just an email. An email went out every day. 
you lived or died by how good that email was and how good that deal was. But that typically carried over into bar and rain a lot of other experiences. Like, especially when you're paying to get people to your site, you need to squeeze as much possible juice out of them as you can so that you don't have to pay to talk to them the next time. And so if that's email pop-ups, if that's kind of incentives or email, whatever it might be, building your own list and your own audience so you can reach them again in the future, I think is mission critical. Um, and I think that's also the way to your point, like it's inevitable that uh, CPMs will go up on the auction-based platform. So you'll get more expensive. Like how do you keep CAC steady? How do you reduce CAC? You need more cheap or free channels that can help balance that out because it's inevitable two years from now, your paid social CAC is going to be whatever it is, 100% higher, 200% higher, who knows? What are the actions you're taking right now to build, uh, you know, an organic community or organic ways to reach out or very cheap ways to touch people that doesn't require just continuing plot money to those platforms? Because you can do it, but you're going to have corresponding increases in CAC. So it's about blending that paid together with organic and I think email is a really critical part of that. Yeah. And even, even not only the paid social, but even organic social, you'll see from influencer accounts or anyone with like any amount of following over time, depending on the platform, their CPMs for the same audience uh, will go down. Like the, the impressions. And I guess what, what the algorithm changes do is they show it to less and less people because now they're showing other content to your own audience. Like in, in the feed, like I'll, yeah. I'll go to somebody's account and in the feed, I'll be shown ads for other people, for example, right? And so you gotta be cognizant of that. Now in 2024, where do you start building an email list? I mean, you're the expert, you're advising a lot of companies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends what stage you're at, right? If you're literally starting from scratch, I think you you do these, it's trite at this point, but you do these things that don't scale, right? Where it's like, you're literally personally emailing people in your network and asking them to sign up for the newsletter. And then you're posting on social and then you're building email and capture on your site. And then you're experimenting as you get into paid with like your email capture rates and making sure that doesn't affect conversion if it's on the commerce side. And then building out your chase campaigns and understanding the impact of collecting an email. Um, so I think it all starts with kind of that sweat of just, Hey, I'm starting this thing. If you're interested, I would love to have you sign up on the list. How do we get to 50 people? How do we get to hundred people? How do we get to 500 people? And then that starts to build on itself a little bit. And then just as I mentioned before, being very mindful about, especially when you're paying to get people to sell to your site, squeezing that juice, right? Is it getting an email? Is it asking them to subscribe to YouTube? Is it you know, trying to get them to download a white paper or, you know, doing a t-shirt giveaway, whatever that is, uh, make sure you're getting max value to people you're driving the site, even if they're not ready to make a purchase right away. Some people make it so annoying these days. I can't, uh, and usually it's, it's even frustrating on mobile is I'll go to a website. And the first thing I'm done is like the, the, the cookie collection is the first pop-up you get right. by default. Right. And then immediately two or three other pop-ups get layered on, I think like automatically, because they don't understand anything about the user experience. And I'm like so mad clicking off, but by the time I've already left the website. Uh, and so I think it's it's important to integrate that in the customer's journey throughout your website is I came searching for something, give me that something. Yeah. Um, get me to a point where I got some value before you slap me with three pop-ups, right? Or just be thoughtful about like, you don't even have to do a pop-up. Be thoughtful about where that data collection lives within the flow, right? Like, can that be the first thing you ask for, or the second thing you ask for, versus bringing an account towards the end? Like, increase your cart abandon um, um, numbers overall by having it as your second step, right? Like, you can be thoughtful about where that's positioned. It doesn't have to be, like, annoy people uh, to the max with pop-ups, but... Well, I think you balance that too, right? Where you'd say it is maybe not the ideal user experience. And I acknowledge that, but we're getting 50% more emails we do that way. And then when we send out the chase campaigns, it actually results in higher overall, you know, number of conversions, it drives down my CAC on paid. So like everything is a balance. And I always suggest that people explore and experiment and see what works 
Um, cause there are no, you know, every business is different and uh, there are no, like, there are very few silver bullets when it comes to stuff. hundred percent. What works for one company may not work for another. Like I found right. email, email to be great, especially, um, uh, when layered in with other things, like say you're building a community, say you're doing online events, in-person events, um, especially for high annual contract value products, um, maybe you're doing events, maybe you're doing webinars, maybe you're doing giveaways, email, like I've, I've seen like email converts the most and then everything else is like significantly lower. That's why um, I wanted to chat about it. Yeah, um, absolutely, I agree. And then after BarkBox, you went on to co-found Roe. Tell us more about Roe and what landed you on Roe. Yeah, so Roe is a telehealth company where you can go online, you can um, connect with the doctor and depending on the condition and the potential treatment, um, you can add an over-the-counter prescription medication shipped to your door or to a local pharmacy. So I got connected with Z and Simon, who became my co-founders at Roe uh, when I was at Bark. And so Saman had, was kind of part of this venture studio that was, that was, uh, involved with Bark and Z was as well. And I knew that when I met those guys, um, I knew that they were looking to start a company. It was a really unique opportunity because I knew marketing, but I didn't know how to fundraise, right? I didn't know how to like build a digital product. Um, Saman was like great at design, great at, um, you know, technical product. Z was a great at fundraising. His dad is a well-known sexual health doctor. Uh, we we kind of had all of the core areas covered to like build out this business. And so that felt pretty unique uh, to find others where we had such complementary skills. And so wound up starting to chat about that in the beginning of uh, 2017. And they got pretty serious pretty quickly. And decided we wanted to start this company together, we kicked around a bunch of different ideas around healthcare. Um, Z was very forthcoming about his challenges with erectile dysfunction from a medication that he had taken from a surgery he had younger, uh, as a younger, a younger man. And we realized like that was a great hook, a great place to start. Like start with something really taboo that people didn't want to touch that felt very skeevy and make it legitimate, right? Like bring in doctors that are really well known that are the experts in these fields. Um, it helped with Z's dad, who's personal friends with many of them and had been in the industry for like 35 years. Um, and so we decided to build a men's health company to start with hope to use that as our wedge to expand into health, healthcare overall. And so we launched in, actually we launched in Halloween 2017. Um, and, you know, we were really excited to spend about six months getting all the infrastructure set up, very different from e-commerce where you kind of like just need your product and you need your website. Uh, in healthcare, you know, you need like, we need a credited and licensed pharmacy for all the states we were shipping to. We need doctors that are licensed in those areas. There was a lot of regulatory red tape we had to um, satisfy before we could get up and running. So we launched, I think, three or four states, uh, October 31st, 2017, and started with erectile dysfunction. And the reason I... I think we were all bullish on it was, you know, this is not like a new product or solution. Like Viagra and Cialis are the most popular profitable drugs of all time. Um, and people wanted access to them. Now this was like, is, does this, uh, fit, like, will people be willing to go online and talk to a doctor versus in person? And very quickly that became evident that people actually prefer it that way versus like, looking your doctor in the eye and telling them you're having intimacy problems with your partner, right? So they called it, uh, the door handle prescription or the doorknob prescription. Just people would come in to the doctor and be like, my knee hurts. And then on the way out, they grabbed like uh, the doorknob and they'd be like, oh, by the way, um, uh, could you write me a script for Viagra? Uh, cause no one like really wanted to talk about it. And so being able to do it this way, we found pretty quickly let people, let, let the um, doctors get a lot more information and provide better care than they could in person in many cases, because people are actually willing to answer questions about it. Um, and from there, we, we felt really good. We've now invested in this platform. We built the national physician network, the national pharmacy network, licensed across all 50 states. 
We had up to 11 pharmacy, physical pharmacy locations at one point. Um, it can now apply all that technology and infrastructure to um, fertility and to weight management and to dermatology and to mental health. And so we use that wedge of men's health and this, um, you know, starting with ED and then hair loss, et cetera, to then build out kind of more of digital doctor's office and digital health system, right? You walk in for hair loss treatment, but then you see the door across the way says cardiology and you're like, ah, Maybe as long as I'm here and they're going to have all the information, like I should be proactive about my health or some of this stuff. So, uh, it was an incredibly exciting ride. I was there for almost six years. Um, very proud of the work um, I did there. We're proud of the team that is still there and a lot of work to be done. Um, but the, you know, the experience was, was um, completely unrivaled, uh, to, um, for me personally. It's a phenomenal way, right? Like start with a hyper, hyper niche. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I talk to. They want to sell to everybody. And and then you're selling exactly. to nobody, yes. right? You you sort of carve out a positioning that puts you as one of the only in that market. I don't want to go to a doctor. It's it's purely taboo, right? Like I think I think these things, even even some of the other products you guys now offer. People don't want to openly talk about it, like fertility issues, right? Nobody's going to talk about like, oh, I'm having trouble conceiving. So, and 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 it's like, ah, oh, you got to kick yourself in the pants to go and get all those blood tests and and go and see a fertility doc. Hair loss, the same thing, right? Yeah, like it's it's all all of these. Even even the weight loss now with I, I guess people are more open given social media about like a Zempic and stuff. But these are all things that were taboo that people only. Oh, didn't want to talk about and you give them like <laughs> like like a, like a private way to to speak their thoughts without looking somebody in the eye and get them yeah. to help them and, and, and our, well, our philosophy there was also like use these things that people deeply care about if it's you know intimacy if it's hair loss if it's fertility if it's crippling acne whatever it is like Things that people wake up and they probably are thinking about first thing as a way to bring people into kind of healthcare system. And then from there, you could almost trick them into being healthy in other areas, right? It's like, Hey, as long as we're doing a blood test for, um, for weight management, like let's run it for these other markers and see how you're doing. And what's your cholesterol look like? And like, what is your blood pressure? And so. That's what I also learned over time as well, which is like, everyone wants to be proactive about their health. They, they say they want to be proactive about their health and take care of themselves and take care of their family. We usually need some big jump to start that process. And that's almost exclusively things that people already care about or they already want to fix themselves. They don't usually wake up and say, I'm going to be proactive about mm -hmm. boom. They say, I want to fix this thing that's impacting my life. And from there, you bring them in, you get a them talking to a doctor, you collect their medical records, search, get lab tests and diagnostics. Then you have a fuller picture and the doctor can help proactively point things out and help, help get them more healthy overall. So it's certainly still in the early stages, but I think finding these hooks was a really powerful learning to then bring people in and help them get healthier over time. You know, most doctors are still not proactive, right? And I think, uh, proactive preventative medicine is a huge space and it's just going to explode and explode because people now tied into their personal data, you can give them analytics on how they're doing, how they're feeling, what they need to be taking. Like even with supplements, certain supplements, I don't even know what I need to be taking. And so then you just copy whatever is promoted to you or what your yeah. friends are taking. Oh, I need to take zinc and I need to take vitamin D. I've been taking like 10,000 IU of vitamin D a day. Um, and then very recently I just did a blood test and it's like your vitamin D is super high to near toxic levels. You need to stop taking. So there needs to be something that I can test myself and figure out what I'm missing and only supplement yeah. with that. Right. So yeah, I, I think there's massive scope. Now, how did you guys decide what products to launch? You started with ED, which makes sense. Personal problem, connection in the space, all, all advantages right there. Uh, given your co-founder's background, but then how did you pick the next product and the next product and the next product? What What's the framework for thinking about 
what to build next? Yeah, I mean, we experimented with a lot of different frameworks, I'll say. After we launched Men's Health, the second product we actually launched was an ill-fated product called Zero, which is for smoking cessation to help people quit smoking. Um, one thing we realized was 18% of men who were coming onto the platform were smokers. That was a big contributor why people were having trouble with, you know, uh, intimacy and brought that to the market. What we found was a couple of things there. One, we learned that even if people know it's something bad that they shouldn't be doing, if they kind of enjoy it, it's really hard to get them to stop doing it. And so we were trying to get people to sign up and pay us to help them stop doing something that they like, even even if they knew that it wasn't great for them. Um, and the second, which is efficacy, the treatments were crazy effective in the same way that hair loss or ED or any of these things, like they can be in the 80 to 90% effective, much less so on some of these other types of conditions. So we learned that from smoking, we learned that from the third product we launched, which is called Rory, which is for menopause. There just weren't a ton of treatments that were terribly effective. And so that product also struggled to get off the ground. Um, but what we were able to do is we were able to leverage that infrastructure we built, the National Pharmacy Network, the National Physician Network, um, the physical pharmacy locations across the country, and find things that people already kind of actively were looking to improve in their life. Dermatology, mental health, uh, you know, fertility. Uh, for an acquisition and weight management. So, you know, certainly some trial and error. Um, and we we were good about shutting things down, I think, versus letting them linger too long. You can just say, ah, oh, it's not that much work to like let this thing live and that it can be another tab on your website. But everything you keep live uh, takes effort from somebody. And so we were pretty good about sunsetting things that clearly didn't have the product market fit that we wanted and moving on to things that did. Uh, but yeah, a real, a real iterative process. What was the, was there a, was it a financial benchmark on these products that had to hit? What, what was that amount that you said, you know what, it's not worth it. Let's just. I mean, some of it was just efficacy of like being able to bring people in uh, from an acquisition perspective. Like how much does it really cost to get somebody to there for this? What do you think the LTV looks like on this? And kind of tell. Um, pretty early on, on on some of these where we had seen the success and what you could get with some of the men's health stuff. And it just wasn't there uh, with, with some of these others. And so, you know, you could say, all right, we could get twice as effective or three times, but if you're 10X all, it's going to be real hard to opt or optimize your way there. And so yeah, there's financial benchmarks, there's CAC to LTB, you know, those ratios, et cetera. Um, but I think he, we also kind of knew out of the gate when you're launching to hundreds of thousands of people that you have on email or you have on these other communities and you're just not getting like the click through or the uptick rate that, that you would expect, that you're probably not going to be able to optimize your way to victory on this. Definitely. Now, um, as you were launching some of these products, right, you said you built this massive network of physicians and, and doctors and, uh, and pharmacies. It's like a, I, I guess there's elements of community-led growth in that you get massive feedback and also referrals. How did you build and scale those networks or those communities? To be honest, community was not really a big part of um, certainly earlier stage growth. Like when you're dealing with more taboo topics, like there's not a lot of community around erectile dysfunction, right? Whereas Hey, like join this email newsletter that I'm on about tips and tricks and improve your erectile dysfunction. Like we didn't have social followings. We didn't have great newsletter opt-ins. We didn't have a lot of word of mouth, uh, but the intent was there. And that's what was really interesting about, you know, starting with ED. It's like, I hadn't worked in a business where there was such high intense, like search volume. People were already thirsty for this and we were just providing them a solution. Um, it was much less organic word of mouth to start. I think now, and again, I'm out of, I've been out of the day to day for two years, but watching what the team has done, when you look at things like weight management or something, et cetera, uh, with GLP ones, there's much more of that community word of mouth, et cetera, because it's become less taboo and it's become more checked about publicly. So I think, um, 
likely enjoying that now, but in the early days, that was not really a thing that we could, uh, we could lean on. We certainly tried, but believe it or not, the referral program did not crash. Yeah. I think, I think with these taboo topics, it's usually like, you'll see anonymous posts on Reddit by huge volume. Right. But then you yeah. still build this online physicians network, the national physicians network and the national pharmacy network. Well, why did you build that? And, and. Uh, how did that help? Yeah, I mean, that was a big differentiator for us versus competitors. Um, there were a handful of competitors that kind of launched and they, they cobbled together, like, we're going to partner with this, you know, third-party pharmacy, we'll partner and, or we'll white label this EMR, you know, we'll, we'll use this partner for XYZ, um, which is a fine way to do it. But we always believed in vertical integration to owning the whole process to create a better overall customer experience. Um, and so... Yeah, literally our first office in New York was half pharmacy, which had to be locked up and locked down. Um, and the other half was like desks and chairs for, for the small team. Um, and so we were always big proponents around vertical integration and making sure we controlled as much of that process as possible. Because you just learn a lot more. You learn about what people want, how to make changes to the product, et cetera, when you're actually owning those pieces of the, of the workflow. Um, and that continues to this day. Row is still... You know, one of the, if not the most vertically integrated healthcare, um, you know, clinics around. There's a diagnostic arm that can ship a a blood um, a blood test kit to your to your home, where you prick your finger and you put it in the center of your use. You put it back in the mail, and get it sent back, and we'll do your blood result. Um, there's just there's been a lot of investment and innovation in that space, and I think it will continue to be really important over time. Definitely. Now, when you say like the National Physicians Network, what is what is that like? What is what is it like an online community? Is it like a, a directory? It's, it, it, yeah, it's physicians who contract with Row, and they are licensed across different states. Some doctors are licensed in one state. Some are licensed in fifty states, um, and they're able to practice medicine. But in order to practice medicine in that state, you have to have a license through the state medical board. And then they sent you, you, you partner with them, you, you service their clients. You probably get a lot of feedback on, uh, yeah, so, so they're kind of row and row is bringing, um, row is bringing potential patients, uh, into the platform. And then depending on, you know, uh, the state that someone is licensed in, if they're working that day, et cetera, that will bring up patients for review. Um, and they'll, they're using the row platform, the row software to review and make recommendations. But they're they're generally not bringing like their own patients onto the platform. You're sending them patients, and they're prescribing. Well, that's that's very smart because, uh, sort of for one for scale, but also then for like word of mouth, customer feedback, yada yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's also important how you build those incentives. Like physicians are not incentivized to write a prescription or or get something mailed. They're compensated for their time, um, and. You know, Rose done a really good job of building out um, ways to make sure that physicians can spend more time at the top of their license. And it's called so like talking about problems, answering questions for um, for patients, and then if there's billing questions or script questions or whatever, there's another team that can that can help with that. But again, I'm out of day to day at this point. I've been out for uh, for two years, and, and so I have some of the historical context. But I know the team has made a lot of changes and adjustments, and continues to grow really quickly. Fantastic. And then you transitioned out and now you're consulting on the growth marketing side. You sit on a couple of boards. Um, you started snagged. Tell us yeah. more about this, this whole thing. Like why leave a rocket ship like that? Um, and, uh, and jump into this sort of, you know, I, it seems like you value freedom now more than anything else, freedom of time. And, and I, I often tell people it's like all my life I chase success and money looking for happiness and I finally realized that success and happiness comes from having freedom, freedom to do what you want, where you yeah. want. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way that I looked at it, uh, um, was, you know, have been really sprinting for, well, 13 years, five years at Bark, six years row, um, and incredible experiences I wouldn't trade for anything, but I kind of got this bug stuck in my head, like how fun and exciting would it be to just take a breath and do nothing for a little bit. Um, 
and felt really good about where the team was. The Intamon are still running uh, the company or doing an amazing job. I felt really confident of the trajectory of Row overall. And I just really wanted to to kind of take a breath and take a break and reevaluate and see, are there other things I can spend my time doing? Can help with some smaller uh, companies that are much at, at a much different uh, stage. It was incredibly exciting to watch the company grow. And at one point, I think it was 900 or 1,000 people at Row. And I think that's just, as you know, like a different set of day-to-day um, -day and different set of requirements from you than it is when you're like getting something off the ground. Um, and so, yeah, splitting some time across nonprofit, across consulting, but really excited about Snag. Um, and domain names has always been like a weird nerdy obsession that I've had, uh, because it's something I've had to do for my companies and then friends companies and that investors would come to me where people are like, Hey, how do we get this domain name? Or like, how do we get the social handle? And I just have loved that. It. It's like a kind of like a scavenger hunt where you're trying to figure out like, Hey, who owns this thing? Like, how do we get in touch with them? How much is this for it? How can I make an offer? And so as I've done more and more of that, I just realized I get such a dopamine hit when I can help close one of these deals, whether it's a really small deal with like somebody coming out of Y Combinator that's just getting started, whether it's like a really big deal with a public company or experienced founders, I realized it's just a problem um, that many people don't get a lot of reps on. If you're a founder or a startup person, maybe you get like one or two times where you're trying to go out and figure out how to buy a domain. I love that now I have like a thousand reps on how this gets done and kind of know how the world works. Um, so it's been great. And I've gotten to work with uh, really amazing people, you know, work with Alexis and um, a lot at, at uh, 776. I work with, you know, Prague, the ex uh, Twitter CEO and Ben Silverman, the uh, one of the co-founders of Pinterest. So I've got an opportunity to work with Really great people on really great projects. Some of them helping with naming, some of them just going and acquiring an asset. But I, I've always just loved this space. Domains feel like the original NFTs to me. Um, and so I, I've had a great time going deeper into this world. Especially if you're, you know, wanting to optimize for search, the first step is people are going to search the name of the category. Yeah. Or, or the company, right? Like, uh, I know pilot.com, for example, they spend a lot of money on acquiring pilot. I don't know if you helped them, but, um, I also know through the circle that, um, meta paid like nine figures for threads.com or, yeah. or close, right? I don't yeah. know if we help with that, but, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the parts of your business is you need to get the .com if possible. So what, yeah. what are some uh, ways that you guys help at, uh, at Snag? And do you help with things outside of domains like Instagram handle? I mean, your, your handle is at Rob. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, primarily domains we have, we can potentially help with social. We'll pass to another team that kind of does that all, all within terms of service from those platforms, but primarily domains. And yeah, sometimes it's people coming and saying like, Hey, we're starting a company and we're like pretty flexible on the name. Help us figure out a name that also we can go get the dot com for. Um, and then other times as people are like, Hey, I'm series B or C D company. Like it's time to grow up. We're going to go start running TV ads. Like we need the dot com. Um, and so we work across that spectrum, um, to help people figure out where to get access to these assets, how much they cost, what the process looks like. Uh, but a lot of it comes down to like three different buckets. There's like knowing how the system works is very valuable because most people outside the space don't really know. Two is just like how to get creative in deal making, which we have a lot of experience doing. And the third is like, I've gotten so many reps on negotiation. Um, it's, it's, I, I feel really confident I can help folks negotiate a really good deal. So like, you know, on the, like knowing how the system works piece. I have, a, I, I have a whole bunch of examples where someone will come to me, they want to get this specific name. We either get in touch with the owner, they're not willing to sell, or we can't get them to respond to us. And then eventually by monitoring things in the right way, have seen these domains just go up to auction and they're available for like 
20 bucks or 500 bucks. And some of these we offered 50 grand to acquire and, and they declined, but because it's a big company and they never keep track of it, it expires and you can just go pick it up later. So a bunch of examples like that, where client was super happy, you got over half price, you know, and they'll, they'll bonus me, bonus me well for knowing how the system works. Um, but that's one example, but then being creative in deal making is another one. Like I have a client wh- who, um, who was trying to get access to, um, a really specific asset and the owner was like post-economic. They're like, I don't need money. Like, I, I don't want to sell this thing. But I wound up figuring out this guy was the board chair of a um, nonprofit that built water wells in Brazil and Senegal. And so I pitched him, I was like, hey, what if we build a water well for your nonprofit and you just give us the name? And he was like, okay, if like, you do that, we can work something out. So we got to raise the money and help with logistics to actually build this well in, in Brazil, in this small village. And then she gave us the domain. So sometimes it's just about getting creative on that stuff. Uh, and then the last one, as I said, it's just about a negotiation, right? Like understanding the back and forth and kind of the parry and repost. Like I had one a couple of weeks ago where the, this guy was set on like, I won't sell the domain for less than, I think it was 50 grand. Um, and just worked him down and worked him down. And we wound up getting the debate for like $4,000 in the end. Um, so there's a lot of strategies and ways that you can kind of, if you're smart, you understand the space, uh, you can get really good deals. And so that's kind of where we bring the table is like, we know how the game works and it's really helpful for folks who maybe are only doing this once or twice to have someone that's like in it pretty consistently to help them navigate. The interesting. How do you charge for your service? Uh, it really depends. Like, again, if it's somebody who wants one specific name, there's certain structure. If it's like you want to do a whole consultative process to help figure out naming and we run down 30 different names for you, it can really depend. But usually there's some sort of, some sort of upfront fee that covers off on the time that goes into like research and outreach. And then generally some sort of success fee. We help you get the name that you want. Awesome. Love it. Why you got, you, you have something you're after? Lobo. I, maybe? Maybe Lobo.com. I don't know what I'll do with it, but I think, I think, <laughs> I think it's hugely valuable to have it anyway, because it might, might do something with it down the road, but I might have uh, Lobo.com or, or another <laughs> domain name. All right. Well, you, you, you think about it. You hit me. Up. We'll, we'll, we'll get you one on the house. But I, I also ask a lot of people, like, you know, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and I'm advising a bunch of companies, LP and a few funds. And people always ask me, it's like, oh, and, I, and the first thing is like, hey, get a name. Like boast is like very easy to pronounce. I would love to get boast.com, for example, for I'm still on the board, still a big shareholder. I think that would be pretty cool. I yeah. helped, I helped us get the, the Twitter handle at boast, but. We had already been using another Twitter handle for a very long time. Mm. And so they, this never got used, but this conversation actually made me ping our new CRO and say, hey, why haven't you guys been using the Atmos yeah, Twitter just handle? swapped over. So you can get it swapped over. But you know what I find is uh, there's a lot of bots for Twitter that in the process of swapping over, they just grab your handle. Yeah. Right? There's, there's a lot of scripts that are running that uh, yeah. a high value handle like this. Uh, if you do a swap over, it, it might just be gone, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Got to be careful, uh, for sure. Cool, cool, cool. So now looking forward, um, if I had a long journey, you said you sprint for like 12 years, what were some of the most valuable lessons you've learned and would you do anything different? Uh, yeah, I mean, plenty of things would do differently. You know, one of the more valuable lessons I remember when I was deciding whether or not to leave or to join, to join Zine Sumatra Row. Um, I was really struggling with the decision. It was, in retrospect, it seemed like an easy decision, but at the time I had been for five years, was very senior there, um, and made a lot of great friends. I had a three month paid sabbatical uh, coming up when you reach five years. Um, we just bought a house in New Jersey. We were having a kid. And I remember really struggling with that. And my wife gave me some great advice. Uh, that I, that I think about a lot, which is, um, are you going to look back and regret not doing this? And for me, that was clarifying because I knew that I would, I knew this was like a really unique, 
um, set of circumstances where I had conviction around the product we covered we were going to build and really felt like the, the two guys I'd be working with were unicorns. Um, and so that was really helpful. And I think putting it in perspective for me, it just like, there's never really a good time to do anything. There's never a perfect time to do anything. And if you're waiting for the perfect moment, you will wind up not ever doing anything. And so understanding that and being willing to take some risk and make some leaps, some smart, calculated, educated leaps, um, but not being afraid to, to take a chance when it, when it presents itself. So I think it's definitely one of the lessons learned there. Um, and I think to that kind of as part of that, I think one of the reasons, as I mentioned, that I was excited about the opportunity on the road side, was just how powerful it felt this combination of complementary skills were at the co-founder level. It's something I talk about with a lot of folks that are getting started and, and they're thinking about founding teams, complementary skills, so important, not just because it means you can do a lot of things yourself, so you don't have to hire people for that. But I think people who overlap too much at the founder level, you wind up over indexing and spending lots and lots of time on like those areas versus the other areas of the business, like the 50,000 other areas that you have to uh, build out and win. And so as, um, as possible, if possible, if you can have complementary skills at the co-founder level, I think it just allows you to move more, yeah. more quickly and nimbly. Yeah, and you don't step on each other's toes. What I tell people is complementary skill sets and and also um, an alignment of values. So you got to be different in, in, the, in the things you do, but align in the things you believe in. Because I think like totally, most, yeah, totally most, most relationships will fall apart because of, because of that values. And a lot of people will have a lot of business people, but they can't find a tech co-founder or a marketing person kind of thing. So I think I think that complementary skill set, you hit the nail on the head there. Now, what has been the lowest point in your entire career? Maybe it's at Row, maybe it was at BarkBox, maybe it's been recently. And how did you navigate it? I think back to uh, the time where prior to Bark, kind of in this intermediate period after I had sold my deal company, and decided I needed to get a job where I was kind of tinkering around with all these different projects. And again, I felt like I'm this super smart entrepreneur, like build things and sell things. And like, now I'll just build the next thing for people to sell, uh, for me to sell to somebody. And I, I remember working on this project. I still love this project and I still think it's a good idea. Not from an economic standpoint, but I had this tool slash company bill called Chirp Guide. And it was meant to be a TV guide for live tweeting. So you could find, if you're watching a football game, you could build your own stream of somebody who's live tweeting the game that's an ex player and a comedian and whatever, like a, a set of fans. And you could kind of see who is on and live tweeting at that time. Um, again, a lovely concept, but I think it was really tough for me to stomach that. Um, I had to, you know, I wound up paying a lot of money to developers to help build this thing out. Twitter wound up changing their API as I was building it out, which was, which was tough. Um, in addition, something I realized was like, so many things have to go right in order for this thing to make money. Like it needs to be sticky enough that I get a lot of users to want to actually log in and use the product. And then I can go approach appetizers and see if they're willing to put money into it. It's like, you have to nail two different things. That was really sobering because one, I wasn't getting traction on the first part with just the users. And I'd spent so much money and I had so much conviction. I just felt like, what an idiot. Like, what an idiot I am for not realizing this up front that like, that I was going to spend months and many, many, many dollars getting to this point, whereas if I'd been a little more thoughtful planning this out and thinking about what domino pieces need to line up, I never would have done it. Um, so I remember that being a pretty tough pill to swallow, but I've also tried to take things away from that and learning about just like building a business. And I'm a much bigger fan now of just launch a thing, see if people will pay you money and then give them that thing versus like build a thing, get customers, sell to advertisers, repeat. Just a much longer, more painful process in my opinion. I hundred percent agree. Like I've, I've been through this process of building and trying to sell and failing, 
And then with Bose, we had no product. We <laughs> we sold the promise. We delivered the promise manually on the back end. And I think I think first couple of million was like uh, low code would jangle together with like Zapier to fulfill. And then yeah. over time we build it. And and even like with, with traction, the community I run, the first conference we did, we didn't even book the venue. We had no money. So I cold emailed a bunch of big name speakers like the Marketos and Post, Postmates and Twilio at the time. They confirmed, put their photos on a website with an Eventbrite widget, sold fifty thousand dollars in ticket, and then they were like, "Oh, I guess we need a venue." Couldn't mm-hmm. find, couldn't find a hotel, so we had to retro uh, fit an EDM hall. So, like those things, like a quick validation, are more exciting kind of thing, right? Yeah, and, totally. And it's totally. A, yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. And sounds like you run down an EDM hall. That was probably a hell of a hell of a content. It was it was crazy because uh, the funniest thing was well, there was a stripper pole that needed to be hidden. the The screen now was you know the pixelated screens, the giant pixelated yeah. screens, the EDM yeah. hall, and we had more speakers than we could accommodate, and so we slotted them all in like twelve to fifteen minute lightning talks. So just don't give us, don't ramble on. Just give us the key learnings on a specific topic. So like, how do we keep people on point here? We put a smoke machine in the backstage and every time the hit time, we'd hit the smoke machine. So it made a, made a sound like, Poof. and people would see the smoke and start clapping. The speaker would get startled, right? When the speaker gets startled, uh, the audience hears the sound and then they start clapping. Now, towards the end of the night, I think it was TechCrunch going on stage with the founder of Meerkat. Back then, Meerkat was super popular. And uh, Frederick from TechCrunch goes, like, why are these guys releasing the smoke? And what had happened was the smoke machine ran out of water and the drapes backstage caught fire. <laughs> and <they started> smoking. <laughs> so that's that's how ghetto you got to start sometimes just to get validation, right? I mean, it sounds like that conference was fire, literally. It was literally fire. <laughs> so now, now that you are doing a bunch of things away from the sprint, how do you balance professional life with personal interests? It feels like you've you've like prioritized the things that bring you joy, like nonprofit and the things that don't take a lot of sprinting and yeah. um, enjoying the marathon of family yeah. and personal life. Yeah. I right so right now I'm pretty comfortable kind of with this lifestyle business where the whole goal is I'll take on as much business for the snag or consulting side that I can personally do, but I'm not looking to hire anyone. Uh, I want to like keep it very flexible. If anything, I'll get them contractors or some 1099 stuff with stuff. But um, I love people. I love working with people. I, I've hired hundreds of people and, and managed, uh, manage a ton. But for right now, I really enjoy like the flexibility of, I'm going to go pick up my kids after we finish this. And like, you know, I'm going to bring them to basketball and soccer and dance lessons this week. And my kids are young. They're seven and nine. Um, and I like being able to prioritize spending a little bit more time with them. You know, when I was like fully in the grind, the hustle, I'd sometimes go days without seeing my kids and that didn't feel great. Um, and so I like this flexibility that I have right now. We'll see what happens in the future. You never say never on anything, but I really just like after, you know, running this this sprint for you know decade plus um, being able to take a breath and make sure i'm prioritizing the right stuff i'm right there with you i think the media has perpetuated this addiction to unicorn porn that you got to keep sprinting and build unicorns uh but in reality the world is run by horses camels and donkeys like the the day-to-day brick and mortar businesses and i think if you don't prioritize the things that bring you joy life will pass you by for me Uh, A bunch of things came to a head after we sold half the company to growth equity firm uh, and I'd come into some cash. I almost died of COVID and everything lost its meaning for me. And then my daughter who was eight, I got three kids, but my daughter, she was eight at the time. She she comes to me and says, dad, why don't you just get a job somewhere? I'm like, why? She's like, at least I'll see you more. All my friends see their dads and they're working. Nobody has a startup like, can you mm. not do this startup stuff? 
and and that broke my heart and yeah you know, a lot, and took oh. a long 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 break to do the same thing after this i'm gonna go pick my kids from school <laughs> yeah it's it's tough it's tough right it's a balance and i don't think you or i would probably be happy with just doing one or just doing the other forever like there's different moments in time where you need to do certain things and prioritize different things you know maybe when kids are older or or you have kids you do a certain, you know, you work in a certain way or prioritize different things. But I think it's just like part of life. It's moving pieces at all times. You have to do what's best for you at, at that point in time. Definitely. This has been a great conversation. Personal, professional, hit all points. As we yeah, close out. Well, thanks for having me. Likewise, man. Thanks for joining. As we close out, anything you'd like to add or anything uh, you want the audience to hear? Where can we follow you? Where, uh, what you you're putting out there yeah um well you could always uh, follow me or dm me on twitter i'm just at rob um or to email me uh, if you ever want to jam on growth or or talk domain names just hi at rob.com um and um yeah always happy to hear from good people and particularly interesting folks that are um looking to upgrade or figuring out their digital assets on the, on the, uh, domain side these days, I find that very fascinating. So feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. Have a wonderful weekend coming up. Hey, you Touch too. Me. And um, good luck picking up the kids. Thanks man. You too. All right. Take care. I need some traction.